Hi, I'm Melinda Vetke. Thank you for joining us here today. Before I start, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land I'm on, the Stony Creek peoples of Lutruwita, and their elders past and present. This is a photo I took of Kings Canyon a few years ago in the Wataka National Park. And what really struck me, struck Gary and I, is the enormity and the incredibleness of the universe, you know, more than any other place in the world. You feel small and you look and see how perfect it actually is. As part of my research, I've been studying the creation stories from our First Nations peoples and understanding more and more how they worked with their lived environment. Their central belief that the relationship between human beings and the natural world should be one of respect and gratitude. They're acknowledging a symbiotic dependence and interconnectedness, not just between animals and plants, but with country. Colonization changed the way our First Nations peoples nourished themselves and the ecosystems that relied on them. It changed the landscape of Australia forever. My topic ties into this equation. What we eat is far more complex than I ever imagined. And yes, the science is important, but truly nourishing ourselves in today's modern society is so much bigger than simply the food on our plate. Some aspects we have control over and some we don't, depending on our individual worldview. A worldview that may be shaped by the belief system we've grown up with and influenced by our lived experience. Unfortunately, our worldview has also been shrouded by the persuasive marketing of what's healthy and what's not from big food for over 150 years, often more interested in profits than people or planetary health. This broad picture, incorporating the past, the present and the future, is what I want to share with you today of lots of stories. So let's get started. My talk is about diverse religious dietary practices that include fasting, vegetarianism, and medical evangelism. It's about unintended consequences from inventions that seemed like a good idea at the time until they weren't. It's about the flawed dietary guidelines and included, and I'm including an update on the latest Australian Dietary Guideline Review. And it's about courage. Who decides what we eat, when we eat, and why? Quick fact, US dietitian Lena Cooper wrote, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. In the Good Health magazine in 1917, edited by none other than Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, who invented breakfast cereal. This was the very same year she co-founded the American Dietetic Association, and her earlier 1913 cookbook was filled with vegetarian recipes incorporating the legume, nut and wheat-based meat substitutes that were invented and patented by John Harvey Kellogg while he was working at the Seventh-day Adventist Battle Creek Sanitarium. To create her recipes, people had to buy Kellogg's inventions, his products, including nuttos and protos, which I believe makes Lena Cooper the very first industry dietitian. She had massive influence, personally training over 500 dietetic students and writing the textbooks that were used globally for decades. Who hasn't heard the slogan? Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. So how do we get to a place where the food industry pays for research and on the back of it can dictate public health education? A place where breakfast cereal companies can decide who can and who can't talk about nutrition. I've discovered over the last eight years, it's really important to understand who's writing the rule books. But to begin, let's start a little closer to home. Who decides what we eat, when we eat, and why? The answer to this question has to be our mums. And maybe you as a mum, me as a mum. In fact, mothers are probably the most influential people in determining the foods our families eat. But what if our mums, and we as mums, have been fed the wrong information 
And instead of nourishing our family, we may have inadvertently caused them harm. I've sat with that fear inside me for a very long time. As a teenager, I watched my mum dutifully swap butter and lard for margarine and seed oils. Only served lean meat and stopped cooking eggs because she was told this would reduce my dad's high cholesterol. Picked up in a routine health check, not because he was sick. Despite this low fat diet, he ended up on statins for years and developed Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. His brain had literally been starved of healthy fats for decades. As a mum, I've watched my own kids struggle with health issues over the years, and I wish I knew then what I know now. Milo, fruit juice, sweet mix, these were staples in our house. Up and go wasn't invented back then, but with a five star health rating, you can hardly blame mums for thinking this highly processed liquid breakfast is somehow a healthy option for their kids. With four teaspoons of sugar, canola oil, vegetable gums and stabilizers, I'm not quite sure how Sanitarium can claim it has the goodness of two wheat bix and milk. Quick fact, Sanitarium's Corporate Food Science and Environment Manager is a key member of Australia's Health Star Rating Technical Advisory Group. These, this group determines the algorithms that as we know, favour high carb, low fat processed foods. He was captured in this tweet by the Public Health Association of Australia, walking them through the objectives and the development of the Health Star rating system. How can a diet high in sugar or dependent on the fortification of cheap processed carbohydrates possibly be considered optimal for a child's health? I should just mention, Milo's health star rating was stripped in 2018 after a public outcry challenging Nestle's claims. They argued that the rating reflected the way they believed Milo was designed to be consumed, three teaspoons in a cup of skim milk. Well, my kids used to eat it by the spoon and my sister sprinkled it on her ice cream. Anyway, the thing is, nutrient profiling systems for front of package labeling aren't only flawed in Australia. This graphic illustrates the limitations of the US Food Compass nutrient profiling scores. Using the Food Compass algorithms, industry could potentially tweak the health food messaging to what you see in this graphic. Nina Teicholz tweeted, what kind of dystopian world has nutrition science entered whereby a university, a peer-reviewed journal, and one of the field's most influential leaders in nutrition can legitimise telling the public to eat more Lucky Charms and Frosted Mindweets and fewer eggs. Using these algorithms, armored M&Ms become healthier than pure ground beef. Surely not. Nina also tweeted, I'd like to feel optimistic about the upcoming White House Conference on Nutrition in September but the guy in charge created this food ranking system. And simply eyeballing these recommendations, she said, should be enough to know this diet is a high carb, sugar laden, candy coated highway to ill health. Seems industry has been shaping White House conferences on nutrition for a very long time. There were two factions debating the cause of heart disease back in the 1960s. John Yadkin, founder of the nutrition department at the Queen Elizabeth College in London, believed sugar was the culprit, while Ansel Keys of the University of Minnesota, of Minnesota defended his cholesterol hypothesis, blaming saturated fat. American clinicians defended Keyes. Prominent nutritionists and the sugar industry were determined to destroy Yadkin's reputation and his career never recovered, which was bad news for Australians. Let me explain. Incredibly, when Professor John Yudkin retired from his post at the Queen Elizabeth College in 1971, to write his book, Pure, White and Deadly, the college reneged on their promise to allow him to continue to use its research facilities. In the meantime, they'd hired a fully committed supporter of Ansel Keys to replace him.
The Dietary Goals of Americans were published in 1977, demonising saturated animal fats in the diet. They also minimised the harms of sugar while praising cereal and grains, gifting the food industry an incredible opportunity to reformulate and create even more highly processed, low-fat, high-carbohydrate products. Unfortunately, the idea that saturated fat is unhealthy has been so ingrained into our culture, it's seen as simply common sense. But the science doesn't support this. The fear of fat worked its way into medical curriculums in the 80s, teaching generations of medical professionals to fear cholesterol. So a Harkham's PhD study highlighted the fact that cholesterol is something so utterly vital to our life that our bodies can make it. She says, if you had no cholesterol in your body, you'd actually be dead. You'd have no cells, no bone structure, no muscles, no hormones, no reproductive system. We'd have no digestion, no brain function. There would be no human life. Let me introduce you to Professor Stuart Troswell, who succeeded John Yadkin as head of the nutrition department in 1971. Looking back to that time, in a talk he gave at the Proceedings of the Nutrition Society of Australia in 1995, he states, public health nutrition seemed to be drifting without a compass. Well, John Yudkin didn't think so. Carbohydrates had bad press and low carbohydrate diets were fashionable for treating obesity. Exclamation mark. I presume he's referring to the Atkins diet. Anyway, after the US dietary goals were published in February 1977, he tried to pass on his enthusiasm for them in Britain, but he claims the establishment were unmoved. So what did he do? He came to Australia. Before I go any further, I want to thank Rory Robertson. His research into Sydney University and their conflicts of interest with industry are phenomenal. His website's called The Australian Paradox, and the information I'm sharing about Stuart Truswell and the beginning of Australia's dietary guidelines comes from him. Truswell continues, I came to Australia to start the Chair of Human Nutrition at Sydney University in 1978. And one of the ideas I brought with me was dietary goals. There was a large seminar organized by the Dietitians Association of Australia that year. So he says he had an opportunity to explain the concept and they set up a committee. He says, we asked for some feedback, but received very few replies. So decided to draft them ourselves. A set of dietary guidelines, which they presented at a two day conference on nutrition in 1979 with support from the food industry. Apparently, the setting was conducive to a positive reaction. Trussell continues, after they'd been launched, the goals were presented to the National Health and Medical Research Council. Apparently, the NHMRC expressed disappointment that they'd not been involved earlier, but despite, despite this, they accepted the goals unmodified. He claims, there was no background review of the scientific literature at the time. He makes the comment, the Australian dietary guidelines were accepted so well because the scientific nutrition establishment in Australia was small and new. Apparently dietary guidelines are popular with governments because they're cheap. Call a committee, organize a few meetings, cost a few airfares, some secretarial work, publish the report commercially, and sit back and wait for the incidence of chronic disease to decline. He goes on to say cardiovascular disease seems to have responded well to these dietary changes. Has he read this? The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare don't seem so positive. Their report states cardiovascular disease was the underlying cause of 42,300 deaths, which equates to one quarter of all deaths in Australia in 2019. Truswell does seem concerned that against these satisfying statistics, there has been little change in most cancers and an increase in overweight and obesity. 
no mention, as Rory's noted, about smoking decreasing and potentially that correlation to a decreased incidence of CBD, nor any mention of the rise of type 2 diabetes, the tsunami of type 2 diabetes, from all the processed carbohydrates we've been told to eat. The increasing incidence of type 2 diabetes since the introduction of the US Dietary Guidelines is demonstrated in Sarah Holberg's 2014 graphic. Despite all this evidence, Stuart Truswell is still claiming leading nutritionists in the US and Europe never took up the sugar and coronary heart disease theory. He wrote this article in 2013. And he makes the point of finishing with the statement, in the UK, Yudkin's peers were concerned and sometimes embarrassed. Well, a 2018 summary of the evidence around the competing theories of fat, sugar, whole grains, and coronary heart disease was published. And it suggests they have known since 2014 that the role of saturated fats in the causation of cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease has been much exaggerated. Refined starchy and added sugars and sugary sweetened beverages cause an increased risk. Seems John Yadkin was right after all. This is Australia's 1992 food pyramid, which influenced Gary as a young doctor, myself as a nurse, and as a young mum, and no doubt many households around, around Australia for a few decades. The food pyramid was based on dietary guideline recommendations of 6 to 11 serves of processed carbohydrates every single day. And back then, one serve was equal to two slices of bread, not one like they claim today. So theoretically, you could eat 22 slices of bread, um, with a bit of margarine, I guess, not butter, and be eating healthily. I had a great chat with Dr. Lucy Burns recently, and she introduced me to the term savoury sugar. It goes beautifully with a graphic I created a few years ago, showing that starchy carbohydrates such as cereal, bread, rice, and pasta, the things we're meant to base our diet on, turn to glucose the minute you ingest them. In hindsight, six to 11 serves of processed carbohydrates per day probably wasn't a good idea for anyone, let alone someone like my husband, whose cancer thrives on glucose sugar. As Nina Teichos again demonstrates, we have followed the guidelines to blame obesity, diabetes, and other nutrition-related diseases on saturated fats or red meat is strongly contradicted by this data. To suggest that more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, fish, and nuts will be a panacea for health are also contradicted by this data. Even the United States Department of Agriculture acknowledges the rise of added fats and oils since the 1970s, when we were told polyunsaturated seed oils and hydrogenated trans fats were healthy. I love this quote from Vanessa Spina. The food pyramid may just be the biggest pyramid scam of all time. So, Australia's dietary guidelines were last updated in 2013. They are currently out of date and need a major overhaul, something the previous Federal Health Minister, Greg Hunt, assured Australians last year will be happening soon. In fact, the panel was announced in September. The National Health and Medical Research Council, NHMRC, are the gatekeepers of Australia's dietary guidelines. The NHMRC have the responsibility of advising the Commonwealth, state and territory governments on health matters. They convene expert committees and distribute over $1 billion in public health and medical research funds annually. Interestingly, unlike 95% of the US 2020 Dietary Guideline Committee, with huge financial ties to the food and pharmaceutical industries, eight of the nine members of Australia's Expert Review Committee and all of the Governance Committee members are clean, as in free of close financial ties to industry. But I still say clean in inverted commas. All 14 committee members have served on other NHMRC committees and have received at least one NHMRC funding grant. Most are many multiples. These people are career academics and they're hardly going to rock the boat or bite the hand that feeds them 
One of the expert reviewers has served on 16 committees of the NHMRC. He co-chaired the Working Party on the 2003 and he was deputy chair of the 2013 Dietary Guideline Reviews. It's hard to imagine he'll change his mind this time around. In fact, as Nina Teicholz recently stated, concerningly, this kind of conflict of interest may be even more powerful than industry as it creates a strong incentive to endorse the status quo. The NHMRC aren't only the gatekeepers of Australia's dietary guidelines, but many other health guidelines too. In 2017, the chairperson of the 22 Governance Committee, Lisa Barrow, co-authored a study into the NHMRC's health database, and she found 70% of their own NHMRC guidelines included undisclosed financial ties between guideline writers and pharmaceutical companies, especially those involved with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Is it any wonder our health system is intent on band-aiding sick care? As I mentioned earlier, Australia's dietary guidelines began in 1982 and have continued to control virtually every context in which the government has a hand in growing food and feeding people, including the responsibility for formulating menus in hospitals and schools, aged and childcare facilities, prisons and military bases. Our dietary guidelines influence the curricula of registered dietitians, the medical treatment of metabolic disease, including diabetes, even though they state they're only for healthy people, agricultural subsidies which favour vested interests, and food industry reformulation. They're supposedly based on nutrition science, and you would assume so, considering the 55,000 research articles the Dietitians Association of Australia claimed to have reviewed in 2013. 55,000, well, they must have been busy. Gary's checked, and there are sections of the 2013 ADGs, the Australian Dietary Guidelines, that have literally been copy-pasted from the 2003 version. No change whatsoever. Concerningly, in 2013, as Gary points out, rather than asking for a balanced risk-benefit review presenting both sides of the debate, the research questions posed by the NHMRC were completely biased from the outset. Creating a data bank of statistical analysis by the DAA in their supposed 55,000 research articles, focusing only on the harms of red meat and the benefits of cereal consumption. Why weren't the Dietitians Association of Australia looking for the health benefits of red meat and the harms of cereal as well? I'm not anti-vegan or anti-vegetarian, nor am I anti-religion. I want to assure you I respect each and every individual's belief and their right to choice. My concern is that choice is being taken away from you and I by those creating and protecting the dietary rule books. Taken away from people who choose to follow low carb and ketogenic principles and who choose to include animal proteins and fats in their diet for their health. I try to stay respectful but I can't always stay silent. I've discussed the dietary guidelines whereby governments got involved in what we eat, but what happened before that? Let's go even further back, right back to the beginning of time. Dietary patterns have been influenced over the centuries by all sorts of religious beliefs, by cultural and societal mores, and there's no doubt that what we eat has been and continues to be very much influenced by our lived environment which I spoke about at the beginning of my talk. The distinct lived environment that shaped the ancestral diets of the Inuit in Alaska contrasts starkly with the Polynesians living near the equator. Consider the disparities between affluent landlocked countries and those that are considered amongst the poorest developing nations in the world. Dietary patterns become even more complex when you consider evolutionary theory, biblical creationism, and creation mythology. Evolutionary theory describes modern humans as originating in Africa and developing over the past 200,000 years as hunter-gatherers. The theory has been credited to Charles Darwin, not because he was the first person to suggest evolution occurs, but because he proposed a scientific mechanism 
that explained the process in 1859. The development of agricultural practices around 12,000 BC and food preservation techniques enabled early societies in Africa, Europe and Asia to form permanent settlements based around farming. They domesticated animals for food and to assist in heavier farming practices. And once sufficient food supplies could be produced, safely stored, it diminished the need to hunt nomadically and to gather for sustenance. Studies have shown that when those early populations started to turn to agriculture, regardless of their locations, the type of crops they produce, a similar trend occurred. The height and the health of people declined. Anthropologist George Malagas made the comment, humans paid a very heavy biological cost for agriculture. Moses was born about two and a half thousand years after Adam was created, and he's considered one of the key figures and prophets in the history of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. He's believed to have written the book of Genesis, which includes the literal six-day creation narrative describing Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Moses also wrote the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, outlining the Mosaic dietary laws for the people of Israel, restricting certain foods labelled as unclean and describing the slaughter process to be used. These are some of the oldest known written records of a society's regulation of its food supply. And I'll come back to this. Stories describing creation are prominent in many cultures of the world. Some talk of a universe birthed from chaos, while others claim humanity was formed in order to release the gods from the burdens of their menial labors. So the gods could rest. I love Australia's First Nations people's creation stories. They're diverse in character, they're similarly themed and go back almost 65,000 years, connecting spirit to people, people to place, and place to culture. It's non-linear, encompassing the past, the present, and the future, and continuing to evolve. Weston A. Price was a Cleveland dentist who traveled the world in the 1930s in search of the cause of dental decay and physical degeneration. He came to the conclusion these things occur when nourishing traditional diets are abandoned in favour of modern convenience foods. And that was in the 1930s. Imagine how horrified he'd be to see the processed foods available to us now. He discovered an ancestral diet appears to have been key to the remarkable health and well-being of indigenous communities he came across worldwide. Isolated and self-sustaining communities untouched by the agricultural revolution of the 18th century and the ramifications of industrialization. In particular, he found Australia's Aboriginal peoples, the traditional custodians of our land, demonstrated unique intuitive skills. Their purposeful seasonal movements enabled them to work with their lived environment, ensuring exceptional health and longevity, not only for themselves, but for the flora and fauna they relied on to survive. Unfortunately, we live in the 21st century and most people in Australia, including a high percentage of those classified as food insecure, have access to an abundance of, well, let's call it food, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's nutritious. Because so many of these cheap calories people eat are highly processed and packaged in ways that disguise their true contents, We've developed a disconnect to our food supply as a result of highly skilled marketing by both vested interests and ideology with support from our very own Dietitians Association of Australia, which was rebranded Dietitians Australia in 2020. We've been led to believe we should be reducing meat for our health and that replacing meat and dairy with highly processed carbohydrates, soy and patented alternatives are somehow better for our health and the health of our planet. Let's just consider, why do we eat? Well, the main reason, and I'm sure you will agree with me, is that food is essential to life. What we eat and when we eat become a personal choice for most Australians, and no doubt amongst this audience, a major goal is to maintain health and avoid disease by eating food that nourishes us. Honestly, it's the who that changes everything. I alluded to it right at the beginning of my talk when I asked, 
What if our mums, and we as mums, have been fed the wrong information? Animal proteins and fats contain nutrients that nourish, not harm. So where is the anti-meat, plant-biased messaging coming from? Until I started my research in 2014, we had no idea that the dietary guidelines were promoting vegetarian, if not moving towards vegan diets. It's no wonder Gary was in trouble. He wasn't just going against the grain advocating low carb diets, he was talking about the health benefits of animal proteins and fats and including red meat in our diet. He was stepping on toes he didn't even know were there. So what are the origins of vegetarianism? Interestingly, vegetarianism has had a long and varied history, appearing to have originated as a moral concept within India and Greece around 500 BC. It's been exemplified by Hinduism, Jainism, Buddha, and the followers of Pythagoras, known as Pythagoreans. While Eastern vegetarianism is based on salvation through self-purification and the concept of nonviolence, the heart of the philosophy is reincarnation and metempsychosis, the transmigration or rebirth of a soul after death. There are two trains of thoughts here. One is that if you build up too much negative karma, you're cast down into animal form to repent and work your way back up to a human form again. Others believe it's an honor to come back into the physical world as an animal, a reward for reaching a certain level of enlightenment. Either way, avoiding meat avoids the chance of accidentally harming or possibly even eating a relative or a friend whose soul may have transmigrated into an animal. Despite Pythagoreans being quoted over and over again as the originators of a vegetarian diet, our actual knowledge of his views are entirely dependent on the writings of others. Legend claims that Pythagoras forbade all animal food because of a devout belief in metempsychosis. He also prohibited the consumption of flesh-like fava beans, believing they too could contain the souls of the dead. Most European religions generally eat the produce from animals and none exclude meat, dairy or fish entirely. Even the Dalai Lama eats meat, and the strictest of all religions, Jainism, allows people to include yak butter in their tea and to cook with ghee. The reason why is because vitamin B12 is essential to health and can only be found in animal protein and fats, or the use of synthetic supplementation, which is unavailable to people. Before this invention, the fortification of processed foods and to most people in third world countries. Western vegetarianism was revived in the 1600s by Shakespeare and known until the mid 19th century as the Pythagorean diet. It was transformed by the temperance health reformers of the 1800s, moving away from the concept of metempsychosis to that of self purification and Christian asceticism. The temperance health reform diet of the 1800s was pushing towards veganism. But as I alluded to before, the alternatives to meat and dairy at that time did not provide the nutrients needed to sustain health. And the term vegan wasn't coined until 1944. Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Taoism, Jainism, and Hinduism all practice fasting that can last anywhere from a few hours to a few weeks. Long fasts are usually in the day and allow people to eat at night. Fasting means no red meat in Catholicism, not no food. Fish is allowed. According to Christian teaching, Jesus died on a Friday and his death redeemed a sinful world. People have written of fasting on Fridays to commemorate this sacrifice as early as the first century. Technically, it's the flesh of warm-blooded animals that's off limits whereas fish are cold-blooded animals. The story I've heard is that Henry VIII was getting over fish. But not just that, he also wanted to remarry. His, his wife, Catherine of Aragon, had only had a daughter and he desperately wanted a son. He fell in love with Anne, but Anne wanted a wedding ring and the Pope refused to annul the decades-long marriage. So Henry broke off from the Roman Catholic Church 
declared himself the head of the Church of England, divorced Catherine so he could marry Anne and have no more fish fasts. As one economic analysis noted, US fish prices plummeted soon after Pope Paul VI loosened the fasting rules in the 1960s. The Friday meat ban, by the way, still applies to the 40 days of the Lenten fast. But a few years before the Vatican relaxed these rules, Lou Groen, an enterprising McDonald's franchise owner in a largely Catholic part of Cincinnati, found himself struggling to sell burgers on Fridays. His solution? The fillet of fish. Despite my research into incredibly diverse religious dietary practices globally, the only church I have found that has at the very heart of its mission a deep commitment to evangelise nutrition and health is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. From the church's founding in 1863, Ellen G. White warned of the physical dangers of eating flesh meat and violating the natures of law authored by God himself. She claimed she was told in vision that fruit, nuts and seeds, foods sourced in the biblical Garden of Eden, were the God-appointed diet for man. Without understanding the elevation of Ellen G. White's extensive writings as divinely inspired interpretation of the scriptures and her belief that it was the duty of the church to actively engage in public health education to control impure desires and base passions, it's impossible to comprehend the implications of the Adventist church's anti-meat messaging in today's society. Sanchez et al. explain in their 2016 publication, Feeding Holy Bodies, a study on the social meanings of a vegetarian diet to Seventh-day Adventist church pioneers, just how Ellen G. White's health reform message allowed food and nutrition to become a medium to communicate Adventist values and ideas. It was used as a tool to open doors to evangelize and a way to take the gospel to the people. Even now, medical evangelism is considered the right arm of the Seventh-day Adventist church and their health reform message, the entering wedge. Take a look at the highlighted excerpt. It's an example I found over and over again, explaining how healthcare, in other words, medical evangelism, offers a unique and unprecedented opportunity for Adventist ministries to shine in countries that exclude other options for their outreach. The global influence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church on diet can't be underestimated, and I didn't make this title up. The publication is an historical perspective on the ideology of the Adventist Church, suggesting nutrition science began with them and are deeply acknowledging their influence on dietary guidelines worldwide. It was co-authored by Joan Sabat, the chair of the nutrition department of the Adventist Church-owned Loma Linda University, who was a recent member of the 2020 US Dietary Guidelines Committee and involved in the subcommittee determining the caps on saturated fat. He teaches a vegetarian vegan doctrine as part of the church's health ministry and has 271 publications listed on ResearchGate with over 10,000 citations, which is a lot of research and a lot of influence. 2017 headlines claimed researchers at Loma Linda found eating beans instead of beef would sharply reduce greenhouse gases. The authors declared no conflict of interest. Personally, I don't believe religious ideology of any description should be informing population-wide public policy, but I find it especially concerning to promote a nutrient deficient diet, fruit, nuts and seeds, and forsaking animal proteins and fats. Not only did Ellen G. White teach that fruit, nuts and seeds constitute the diet chosen for us by our creator, but she said, it's been clearly presented to me that God's people are to take a firm stand against meat eating. And among those waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating, meat eating will eventually be done away with. Flesh will cease to form a part of their diet. When Ellen G. White came to Australia from 1889 to 1900, she set up Sanitarium Health Food Company under the umbrella of the church. It was to be based on Kellogg's model but this time have the church own it. She said, the health food business is to supply the people 
with food which will take the place of flesh meat, milk and butter. The South Pacific Division of the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church oversee the work of the Australian Health and Nutrition Association Limited trading as Sanitarium Health and Wellbeing Company. This is essentially the health food production department of the church. It includes life health foods. And while Sanitarium promotes a holistic health and wellbeing message on its parent website, talking about the pioneering nutritious plant-based foods, sustainability and social purpose with a warm and welcoming feel, it comes as a big surprise to find the graphic with so much misinformation on life health foods alternative meat company targeting the animal agricultural sector and blaming innocent cows for global greenhouse gas emissions. Personally, I think the claim that 2 million Australians are following a plant-based diet and that this means we're becoming vegetarian is slightly misleading. I consider myself plant-based, as in I eat vegetables now in place of the processed starchy carbohydrates since going low carb, but that doesn't make me a vegan. By the way, I decided to check out the government's agricultural website for some clarification around this claim that 57% that of our land mass is used for grazing. Well, you can see why. It explains that most of the animals in Australia are grazing on grey shaded areas which happen to be native vegetation and areas reliant on natural rainwater. And they claim that only 3.5% of Australia's land mass is used to grow plant foods is pretty self-explanatory. Imagine if the grayed out area used for grazing on natural vegetation was planted with crops. Imagine how much irrigation would be needed and how intensive that farming would have to be in Australia's desert. Seems the alternative meat company's marketing is targeted at young people unaware of the misinformation being fed to them about the supposed correlation between meat and climate change. Their future customers, as backed by this report in 2016 from Life Health Foods, claiming to reap the benefits of an increasing number of people choosing a plant-based diet, and their anticipated 25% growth is mostly driven by a rise in vegetarianism among millennials looking for world solutions. The alternative meat company is asking Aussies to give up meat to save the animals, but no mention of their religious beliefs, nor that the money that you spend on their products will help grow the church in the South Pacific. Before I go further, I'd just like to do a quick summary on Sanitarium's influence on dietary and health guidelines in Australia. Influences that I believe contributed to Gary's silencing and have profoundly influenced the silencing of low carb by dietetic and medical associations. Because as we all know, Low carb and keto diets go against the grain. My husband, Gary, was reported to the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency, the APRA Medical Board of Tasmania, in 2014 by a dietitian working at his hospital. He was reported for recommending his patient with diabetes complications and uncontrolled blood glucose levels, being fed three desserts per day as per the hospital menu, reduce their sugar consumption to try to improve their health outcomes. I'm serious. He was then investigated for two and a half years for advocating real food, and he subsequently became the only medical doctor in the world, silenced from advocating nutrition to improve health outcomes to his patients or to the public for the rest of his medical career silenced even from recommending people reduce sugar. Meanwhile, the Australian Health Authority has allowed a Melbourne University professor who's since become the Chief Executive Officer at the Australian Diabetes Society to give shocking dietary advice, suggesting the Australian public buy a burger and chips with Coke based on his interpretation of a scientific breakthrough study, his study involving nine mice who failed to put on weight with a high fat, high sugar diet. Just what every mouse should be eating. Anyway, I uncovered documentation stating Gary was targeted for active defense by the Dietitians Association of Australia 
protecting their corporate partners. Why? Apparently their serial sales were down. Incredibly, for a mere $23,000 per annum, the DAA were to use their members to influence, protect and actively defend cereal grains and even sugars messaging. Are dietitians aware, do they have any idea that their parent association that accredits them, educates them and regulates them was in bed with cereal for brekkie? The four major cereal companies that made up the ABCMF, which disbanded last year, were Sanitarium, Nestle, Kellogg's and Freedom Foods. And they weren't happy. Sanitarium was acknowledged as a platinum sponsor of Nutrition Australia back in 1999, giving them opportunities to sponsor programs, publications, conferences and forums. And their ties have continued. General practitioners in Australia had Sanitarium literally gifting them educational health resources for 20 years to hand out to patients during consultations with a click of a button from medical software installed on their desktop computers. Encouraging people with diabetes to base your meals on carbohydrates, spread them throughout the day, reduce fat, especially saturated fat. And what about sugar? Well, apparently a moderate amount is acceptable. And this was endorsed by Diabetes Australia Anyway, for insulin resistance, it comes as no surprise. They recommend a diet based on whole grains, fruits, vegetables, legumes, and nuts. The pregnancy fact sheet even suggests their own cereal brand, Wheat Bix. These resources not only promote the Seventh-day Adventist Church's dietary beliefs, but they do their business model no harm. In 2014, Sanitarium acquired the rights to the Complete Health Improvement Program known as CHIP, whose founder, Hans Deal, acknowledges that he is 100% vegan and his CHIP program is total vegan. Well, CHIP is based on the Adventist Health Reform Principles and delivered to their churches and healthcare institutions. Adventist volunteer volunteers can then facilitate community and corporate wellness programs worldwide to Adventists and non-Adventists. Despite claims on their website, the chip is not a mandate for vegetarian or vegan diets. The facilitator's guide shows pretty clearly what the Adventist Church's position is on stimulants. We promote that less is more with the ideal being none at all if you want to avoid the worst possible health outcomes. These recommendations don't just apply to alcohol and processed foods, but to meat, dairy and eggs. In fact, they are at the top of the list. Lastly, a little close to home, Life Education is Australia's largest provider of preventative health and drug education to school children. This new partnership between Sanitarium and Life Education aims to teach children how to make healthier food choices through the development and delivery of a new nutrition model for middle primary school kids, which also includes resources for teachers and parents. What if I don't ascribed to the dietary teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Do I want my grandchildren to be taught this, that this is healthy? A biblical garden of eating diet devoid of animal proteins and fats? Do I have a choice? For every action, there is a magnified reaction. And I know Newton's third law of physics states it's meant to be equal, but from much of my research, the invention of health foods designed to take the place of animal proteins and fats and our dependence on sugar have stemmed from temperance movements of the 18 and 1900s with a magnified reaction, impacting our health as an unintended consequence today. I want to share three inventions from the 1800s with you that potentially were a good idea until they weren't, and then talk about the men that devoted their lives to calling them out. Breakfast cereals were invented by temperance health reformers in the 1800s to curb sinful masturbation. Coca-Cola was invented as a pain relief, marketed as a health tonic before it became a soft drink during prohibition. Procter and Gamble invented Crisco after discovering hydrogenated cottonseed oil used in their candles and soaps at the time resembled lard. Well, 
modern day breakfast cereals were invented as part of an anti-masturbation crusade amongst temperance health reformers of the 1800s. Think Sylvester Graham, Caleb Jackson, and the infamous Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. These men preached that flesh meat was a toxic stimulant that defiled not only men, but women and children, morally, spiritually, and physically, leading to self-vice, which was the Puritan term for masturbation. Conversely, they taught, bland diets would reduce those baser passions and increase spiritual purity. John Harvey Kellogg's brother wanted to add sugar to the cornflakes they'd invented to make them more commercially viable. The brothers disagreed and separated and William Keith went on to create the cereal empire we recognise today. While John Harvey Kellogg, to continue to reduce sinful intemperance, experimented and invented alternatives to meat and dairy. Over his lifetime, John Harvey Kellogg invented over 30 patents for food products and processes. John Pemberton, a pharmacist, originally invented Coca-Cola as a more suitable painkiller to the morphine which he was addicted to after being badly wounded in the, eight, in the Civil War in 1865. In the 1880s, he sold it as Pemberton's French wine coca, advertised as the world's great nerve tonic. But to avoid financial ruin, he had to develop a non-alcoholic version of his drink after Atlantic City officials passed legislation in 1887 that made beer and liquor licenses a luxury item few could afford. He increased the caffeine and the sugar content to produce a sweet sugary syrup. And this was mixed with carbonated water and sold at soda fountains. Incredibly for 18 years, Coca-Cola contained a small amount of cocaine. Kansas was the first state to outlaw alcoholic beverages, adding legislation to its constitution in 1881. By 1917, Congress had passed the Prohibition Amendment, which ratified by the states in 1919 and wasn't repealed until 1933. Soda fountains began flourishing in pharmacies and in ice cream parlours and became known as the New American Bar. They were declared an ally of temperance because respectable people, families, friends and neighbours, could gather together to socialise without alcohol. Some communities remained concerned that soda water was being added to some alcoholic drinks and they wanted soda fountains to be banned on Sundays. But along came a treat that could be eaten, an ice cream sundae. So the hard drink became a soft drink. Astoundingly, Coca-Cola sold 9,000 gallons of its flavoured syrup in 1890, which became 1 million gallons by 1904. By 2020, Coca-Cola products were served at the rate of 1.9 billion times a day. It's nearly 30% of the entire human race, drinking soft drinks produced by Coca-Cola each and every day. While Procter & Gamble were known for making soap, their bestseller prior to 1879 had been candles. Then Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, and it looked as if candles were going to become obsolete. There was also an issue of animal fats, which had traditionally been rendered and moulded into soaps and candles for centuries. These were becoming more and more expensive in the 1800s. William Proctor and James Gamble were on a mission to be the very first company to make mass-produced, individually wrapped bars of soap in the hopes of boosting their sales. Edward Kaiser, a German chemist, wrote to them in 1907 and said he discovered a new chemical process called hydrogenation. And this created a solid fat from a liquid fat. This cheap waste product from cotton production made their dreams possible. The thing is, it looked like lard. In 1910, Procter and Gamble filed a patent for this new creation, describing it as a food product consisting of vegetable oil, really cottonseed oil, partially hydrogenated and hardened to become a homogeneous white or yellowish, semi-solid, resembling lard, to be used for shortening in cooking. Cottonseed oil is actually a toxic byproduct of cotton production 
It's cloudy red and bitter to the taste before it goes through more than 20 steps of industrial processing, bleaching and deodorization. This, hydrogen, this hydrogenation turned the liquid fat to a solid fat. As it turns out, Crisco was introduced to the public in 1911, around the same time Americans were increasing their sugar consumption from Coca-Cola and sitting back to enjoy processed high carb breakfast cereals from Kellogg's, the most important meal of the day. This became the perfect storm for metabolic disease, as Gary would say. So who were these men calling out the harms of refined breakfast cereals, sugar, Coca-Cola, and hydrogenated fats? Robert Atkins, John Yadkin, Harvey Wiley, and Fred Kumaro. Dr. Robert Atkins caused quite a stir within the nutrition circles when he published the Dr. Atkins Diet Revolution in 1972. It was based on low carb, high fat, and higher protein diet. Incredibly, Atkins diet was targeted by the Victorian government in a public health campaign in 2004. And there was talk that doctors risked losing their medical license if they spoke about it to their patients. Luckily, Dr. Eric Westman's curiosity was aroused in the 1990s when two of his own patients managed to lose weight following the Atkins diet. He organized to meet Dr. Atkins and after chatting together, Eric Westman initiated a randomized control study with Jeff Wallach and Steve Finney, published in 2004. While both groups showed improvements, the low carb diet did better than the low fat diet for weight loss and metabolic syndrome. I've already spoken about Dr. John Yadkin. Apparently in 2008, when Dr. Robert Lustig came to speak to a group at one of the universities in Adelaide, someone came up to him and said, I suppose you've heard about Yadkin, a British professor of nutrition who sounded the alarm on sugar back in 1972 in a book called Pure White and Deadly. Well, he hadn't heard about him. So he went and investigated and found a book in a library buried away. I wonder if the Australian scientist was intending his comment as a little bit of a warning, you know, don't go there. Luckily, Dr. Robert Lustig did not listen and continued to campaign against the harm or campaign about the harms of sugar. Gary and James Mukey, Australian of the Year 2020, have been very vocal about it in Australia. The food industry, and in particular Coca-Cola, have had a long history of agitation and lobbying against regulation and policy. Even Harvey Wiley, a doctor and a chemist who recognised early on the need to regulate the adulteration of food, couldn't stop their influence despite introducing the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906 at the request of President Roosevelt. Food manufacturers, as well as appointed officials, fought fiercely to modify or repeal the law. Wiley even took Coca-Cola to court in 1911, but he couldn't win. After leaving the USDA in 1912, frustrated, he became the director of the Good Housekeeping magazine. He decided he could have more success writing columns in women's magazines so that women, as consumers, as mothers, would know the truth about the products and could make an informed choice about what they fed their families. He dedicated his life to protecting public health. But my favorite story has to be Fred Kumo, a man who seriously wouldn't give up despite losing research funding and being relegated to a back room. He never stopped calling out the harms of hydrogenated fats. He recognized early on that dietary sources of, of cholesterol, like meat and eggs, had no influence on heart disease unless they were prepared in a manner that oxidized the cholesterol. Kumo's early work on heart disease led him to realize decades before anyone else that artificial trans fats in foods were clogging arteries and interfering with the blood flow. His earliest research on trans fats dates back to 1957. In 2009, when Fred Kumo was 94, he filed a citizen's petition against the US Food and Drug Administration 
requesting that it ban partially hydrogenated fat from the American diet. When the FDA failed to respond to his petition, after four years, Fred Kumaro, then 98, filed a lawsuit. Three months later, the FDA announced that trans fatty acids are not generally recognised as safe for use in food. He'd won, but it took him 50 years. Lived experiences shape our life. They then become our motivation. Are you here, like me, because of your own health journey or because the healthcare system, intent on band-aiding sick care, has failed you or someone you love? It's certainly a very powerful motivator. Lived experiences prove that courage is mortal. It's not about superpowers. Superman was not brave, standing in front of a speeding train, knowing he couldn't get hurt because of kryptonite. Courage is being curious. Courage is questioning the rule books. It's about standing up for what's right. It's about inspiring and empowering others. It's about being a change agent no matter what the cost. Gary refused to be silent about the harms of sugar, even when he was being bullied and mobbed in his workplace, had his academic teaching position taken away and research projects terminated. He was threatened with losing his medical license simply because he refused to be silent, to withhold information that he believed would cause harm to his patients. He stood up to medical regulators and I was so proud of him. The more you have to lose, the braver you become. And as many of you will know from your own experience, I can tell you, when Cyril Fabrecki came after my husband, the mama bear came out. You never know when you may become a superhero in someone else's story. Thanks so much for listening today. I really enjoyed creating this presentation and I want to do a huge shout out and thank you to Tracy McBeath, who has the courage to be curious, to get together this incredible group of women presenting over the next three days, and all of the people who've gone before us and have called things out and stood up. I can't thank them enough. We stand on the shoulders of giants. Keep being noisy with me. Thank you.